Thank you very much. And uh, I know that for the organizers like Joseph is getting uh, to everybody saying thank you. And I just want to point out, it's incredible to, to be host of 500 people and yet writes individual emails to all of us. You know, attention to the details, that's what I would say. Uh, thank you very much. And tremendously honored and, and glad to be part of this conference. I've been learning so much already for the first day and a half. And I'm tell, coming to tell you a little bit about dipolar molecules. And you can see that a lot of connections can be made for the talks we have already heard. I was trying to make a slides even just 10 minutes ago because Chiao Meng Fao just gave a fantastic talk, so I have to put his name in. And, and it, I'm gonna tell you today a little bit of a, a new story where we have a dipolar molecules finally is coming on the scene where you can prepare degenerate Fermi gas, quantum gas, in individual pancakes, and uh, you can turn on electrical field, you can turn on microwave. These dipolar interactions are going to govern how the molecules come together and collide. At the same time, we know if the molecules are not moving, they can still be mediated by dipoles to exchange their spins. So now think about this. When we put a coherence, put a microwave into a dipolar matrix element between the, between the two opposite parity molecular state, when they come together, they're going to have exchange spin information. They're going to collide. And when they collide, there's a phase shift. And the dipole is going to change during the collision and so on. So it's becoming a really complex system. But we can control every single step along the way. And that's really exciting. Let me go on to advance my slide. So why do we study dipolar molecular systems? And that's because of electrical dipole moment that we can control with electric field. Now, as I mentioned, uh, now that we can actually control, make molecules one pancake at a time, and we have heard great talks from Francesca, the first talk of the conference talking about 2D supersolid with magnetic dipoles. And we have heard things, more results coming from different groups. We're about to hear a super exciting talk from Wolfgang. He can hardly contain his energy. He was telling me he's going to jump up on the stage very soon and uh, to tell us about interlayer coupling between, between these uh, uh, magnetic dipoles of a chromium. I'm going to tell you about using electrical field to tune the interactions, both the strength and the angle. But more than that, uh, you know, if you start to think about these are individual Fermi C's colliding with each other with the strong interactions of a dipole mediated by dipole moments. But if the temperature gets sufficiently low, there's inter-pancake coupling will come in. And in fact, that's what Wolfgang is going to talk about. But you can also turn on microwave field, where you can have a coherence of these dipoles. So there's all kinds of dipolar physics you can study. Furthermore, you can tilt the angle of the electrical field. You can apply electrical field gradient and use that to select individual pancakes. You study superfluids. You can study topological insulators. So there's just tons of pioneering work from our theory colleagues. Magic Lewinstein here uh, is one of the very early pioneer thinkers about all these dipolar systems in 2D. And I think we are starting to get into that regime now. So let me start with dipolar spin lattice, where dipoles are confining individual 3D optical lattice sites, and they're not moving around, so there's no motion. Motion is frozen. And what you have is a, a, a molecules. We don't have to talk about fancy states like Eric Cornell uses for searching for EDM. These are just good old-fashioned rotational state with opposite parity, and you can think of you're picking two opposite parity rotational state and that's your spin half system. In my talk, I will show you that we can actually pick which rotational sublevels and it will actually allow you to change the sign of the dipolar interactions and so on. But just suffice to say, there's a spin half system you can build. You can turn on microwave and put a coherence into a system. For example, flip spins in the mid roll of the rotational state. And you can actually watch, the, even though the, those molecules are staying put as a physical uh, uh, system, but their rotational excitation can be exchanged back and forth mediated by dipolar interaction and an energy scale of about 100 hertz or so. And you can actually do Ramsey spectroscopy if you put, put a spins in coherence superposition, actually watch the, this exchange interaction as, a, as a, a modulation on the Ramsey fringe. So, in fact, you can, of course, turn on the full electrical field. As you turn the electrical field, both the DC and the microwave, as you tune the electrical field, you can actually go through this kind of a phase transition where 
the spin exchange interactions start to be much bigger than the, the Ising interaction, but they can switch, or they can switch sign, you can control. This is three dimensional spin half system with kind of a full Hamiltonian control. And I, just because yesterday there was a really interesting exchange between Bill Phillips and, uh, and Jonathan Holm, Bill, Bill was asking a question about coherence. And I really like Jonathan's uh, answer was, well, coherence is only about when you can see physics. Uh, no, when coherence is long enough, you can see interesting physics, then that's good enough. And then Eric Cornell had a comment about, well, it's really important to pay, pay attention to go to the poster sessions, because you never know when the next new idea is going to, going to come from. And that reminded me that, you know, the discussion also like 18 years ago with, with Michel Lukin. Uh, and uh, Derek Chen was a first year graduate student of Misha. And of course, Derek now has his own academic offspring, you know, in Anna, who gave a fantastic talk today. At the time, we were worrying about, well, we have these clocks. And as we develop a clock to the next generation of precisions, do you have to worry about dipole-dipole interaction? You know, these are old topics, as the magic uh, reminded us. But in, what's new is, of course, we cannot create these super low entropy quantum systems and the light and the matter interaction can be controlled extremely well. This morning, there was also discussion about whether you can look at a super radiance, you can look at, we just heard a, a hot talk from uh, uh, Tillman, and, and he told us with cells, he can see all these frequency shifts. And I'm happy to report to you, now these are the systems which are super weak in dipoles. It's a micro divide. And, and so interaction is many orders, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 18 orders magnitude below the Rydberg, constant, Rydberg interaction and so on. You can measure, however, if you have long enough patience, if the coherence is long enough, tens of seconds, you can see those frequency shifts directly in the clock. So in, it's, in some sense, you, know, you will have a new radiative dipolar spin lattice, where the dipole-dipole coupling is not just one over R squared, one minus cos three cosine squared theta over R squared, a cube, sorry, but it, you actually have retarded uh, interactions like e to the i k r of a k r, which can lead to frequency shift and superradiance, and we cannot directly measure these in the clock. Uh, in some preliminary data, for example, we are here is showing by taking an image of the 3D lattice, we can actually compare dipolar, uh, strong dipolar transition. When I say strong dipolar, it's like one micro divide versus 0 0.2 micro divide, and you can see the dipolar shifts. It can be directly imaged through these clock transitions. And I'm making this point is to just to show you physicists like us are very versatile. The energy scales, when, when Eric Cornell was talking about EDM, he's doing this PICO EV kind of a precision physics and he's controlling, you know, GEV, TEV kind of physics. Here we are talking about dipolar interactions ranging by many, many orders of magnitude, but, and with different coherence time, you can manifest the similar kind of physics that we are talking about now today. But my point today is to tell you about the itinerant spin dynamics. So I already made this point where we can use electrical field to control these dipoles, which are uh, mediated by these spins, uh, um, represented by the, those rotational opposite parity rotational states. As you turn on electrical field, DC electrical field, these individual rotational states start to acquire parity. Uh, uh, and you will start to have a dipole moment, induce the dipole moments of individual uh, spin state. And you can actually see that the dipolar interactions is changing as a function of the electric field. There's also spin exchange interaction from spin down to spin up. So this is kind of a cartoon, in a cartoon way, uh, uh, illustrated those dipolar interaction. If, if these molecules are not moving around, they will still be interacting by this long range dipolar interaction. But what if now let molecules go free? They can now move around on this uh, skating rink. Oops, sorry. And so as these molecules come together when they collide, if they have dipoles, they're going to change the phase of those spins by collision of physics. So when you deface the system, then the dipole moment in principle gets smaller, and that will in turn will reduce the collision or cross-section. So you can immediately see there's a lot of spin motional coupling, all mediated by the dipole that you're controlling with DC and the microwave field. It's a complicated system. And I will show you that how we actually get to the point where we can study systems like that. Uh, 
a few years ago, we were finally able to use this technique of uh, um, basically fuse together two degenerative the quantum gas of atoms, rubidium and potassium, through this combination of flashback resonance and a stir-up to create degenerative Fermi gas of molecules. Um, and this process now finally have given us a, a 3D dipolar gas with a T over TF of a 0.3 or so. And I'm happy to say there are now a number of groups coming up to a similar sort of a regime, as particularly the NPQ group has reported also sodium potassium Fermi gas of molecules. And when we turn on electrical field, the, the first thing we have to um, deal with is the loss of molecules, which is a quite uh, universal feature that's not encountered in atom, but in molecules, the two-body loss is a big problem. As you turn on electrical field, the, this uh, isotropic sort of interaction regime, uh, sorry that I'm still getting used to the laser pointers and the star advancer, this gets modified by the fact that you have electrical field and molecules have to be lined up. They can line up head to tail, they can line up a parallel uh, in, in their collisional process. So the barrier can be raised and lowered. And in 3D, this, this dipolar interaction tends to enhance the loss. The reason being, of course, you're modifying this long range um, Van der Waals potential um, with, with this long range dipolar interactions. And this is attractive. Uh, interaction allow you to lower the barrier and the, the molecules attract each other to, to, for the two-body loss. So this is the first thing you have to solve, which is by putting the molecules in 2D, where you can make a pancake of uh, molecules, and with, in, in essentially with uh, six electrodes, you can actually control very well the, the electrical field, both in terms of the orientation and the gradient, and also even the curvature. And this is a kind of experimental setup where it, uh, the molecules are created in between these six electrodes. And we put we jammed together a lot of different laser beams in there with the cross dipole traps, with optical lattices and so on. And we can also put a high resolution imaging. You can select this individual slide with the help of electrical field gradient. And the one thing that I know that Wolfgang is going to emphasize is the control of the, the, the stability of the field and the control of the, the fringe. For example, we can actually control the position of this optical lattice with respect to the electrodes at the level of 10, 20 nanometers. Because if I apply electrical field gradient, and if my lattice is moving around, then the molecule will see different electrical field and it will lead to a lot of noise. So with the electrical field and with the molecules perpendicular to, um, being uh, polarized perpendicular to the pancake direction, you can, you can get to this very favorable regime where elastic over inelastic collision cross-section can exceed 100. And you can use this process to, to do evaporative cooling, for example. Here's experimental data showing that as you turn on electrical dipole moment by turning on electrical field, the elastic collision cross-section uh, gets increased by many orders of magnitude while the inelastic loss is suppressed, or at least it's not increasing dramatically. And this is, again, thanks to some of pioneering theory work that predicted those effects uh, more than a decade ago. So with this technique, we can uh, use elastic collision at the same time, engineer the curvature of the electrical field to soften the dipole trap. We actually do not have to lower the trapping depth. Just, you just have to add this anti-curvature for the trapping by the electrical field curvature, and you start to have hot molecules evaporate from the top of the trap, and it cools down. And we can actually see very nicely, even in 2D, we can uh, get into the degenerate Fermi gas regime. In 2D, the density of states is lower, so it's easier to get into the Fermi degeneracy where you see excessive energy due to the poly blocking when you get into a T over TF less than one. So with that technique, you know, the temperature is lower, the P wave loss is lower, we feel a little more encouraged. Now we can think about starting to play with electrical field orientation. We do not have to always keep the electrical field to be perpendicular to the pancake. What if we start to turn the electrical field angle and uh, eventually you can turn the angle all the way to be having these molecules lying in the, in the plane. And of course, in this case, you have lossy channel, the L equals to one, which is a one H by unit of angular momentum since that these are identical fermions you have now M equals to zero head to tail collision opening up, which will lead to loss. But nevertheless, because temperature is relatively low and we can control the process 
really well as we can turn the electrical field on and off and or rotating its position, we can venture into this regime and actually measure the loss as a function of uh, electrical field. For example, here shows the two-body loss coefficient as a function of the electrical field uh, angle. And this is a necessary step. We have to go through this because if we want to use electrical field to tune the dipole control, especially we want to go to so-called magic wavelengths, we're using the angle of the electrical field with respect to the polarization of the light to control the polarizability of molecules with respect to different rotational state. This is the technique we'll use to rotate the electrical field. And as we were doing this, we came upon an interesting effect, it's, called, it's a collisional resonance. This is not re Fashbacher resonance, it's more like a Foster resonance in, in Rydberg's uh, physics, where if you prepare atom, two molecules in, in rotational excited state, one zero, and the two molecules, imagine two molecules in, in rotational excited state, come together, collide. Under different electrical field, the two rotational excited state molecules will be, at a certain electrical field, they will come across as energy to generate with one molecule at zero, zero, the other one at two, zero, or two plus minus one. These are different rotational angular momentum projection. At this crossing, this energy degeneracy, because of the dipole-dipole interactions, these crossing will be avoided such that if you are on this side of the, if, you, if the molecules are preparing one, zero, one, zero, and you're approaching this crossing from below this electrical field resonance, you will see the barrier gets pushed down. If you're coming from above the electrical field, you will see the barrier gets pushed up. Okay, what does that mean? That means that this van der Waals potential of the two molecules now gets strongly modified by the fact that you have this electrical field induced dipolar interactions. On one hand, you have this very strong barrier from the electrical field above the resonance or very much low, reduced the barrier from below the resonance, and that leads to a huge modulation of the loss, two body loss rate by three orders of magnitude, whether you are coming from above the resonance or below the resonance. And you can plot this as a function of sort of electrical field induced collisional resonance. You know, this is essentially telling you the two body loss rate as a function of electrical field. It's a super sharp transition. Uh, about, um, basically 1% change of electrical field will lead to three orders of magnitude difference in the, in the two body collisional loss rate. And this turns out also works in 3D. Uh, and Jim Lu's uh, led this collaboration with, uh, with a theorist, John Bone and uh, Gouvan Kermenier, where we actually now, instead of confining molecules in 2D pancakes, you can actually confine them just in dipole traps here. And, uh, and you can see exactly similar kind of electrical field resonance. It tells you these are dipolar-dipolar interactions. It's a spin resonance. It's a, it's a resonance due to the fact that the two dipoles coming together they become degenerate with zero, zero, and the two zero states, and, and the dipolar repulsion modifying this uh, van der Waals potential does not really matter whether the dipolar orientation is. And so if you park yourself at this suppressed loss coefficient location here, you can actually see elastic collision cross-section dominating of an inelastic collision cross-section by a factor of 15 or so in 3D and you can use this technique to do evaporation in 3D. You don't actually have to, don't have to do this in 2D. So all this is good, meaning that we are starting to really learn how to turn on the dipole moment, controlling the loss, and then start to see how the dipole-dipole interaction leads to some interesting dynamics that we'll observe in the gas. So now let me go, down, go, back, to, go back to the 2D system. Now we can just try to go back to select individual layers. And, and in some sense, it's quite easy to understand. We actually tilt the electrical field to a particular angle where we have the so-called magic angle where the rotational ground, the rotational excited state will enjoy the same polarizability. So you will, you will enhance the rotational coherence if you put a coherence in your system. We also apply a gradient across the pancake, layer of pancakes such that at different locations Remember, we stabilize the, the lattice quite precisely with respect to the electrodes. So, so each, each pancake is sitting at a particular electrical field. And that means that their, AC, their DC stock shift by the, that by the electrical field will give rise to different resonance frequencies if you drive microwave. So use, you use a high resolution microwave spectroscopy, especially when you tune to their polarizability to be equal you'll be able to just see like one pancake at a time when you drive with a microwave transition. This is just sweeping the microwave frequency across these three pancakes and you can select any pancake you want. 
And in fact, we can start with 19 pancakes and select one. The more than that is each pancake, you can also basically create arbitrary rotational state if you want as well. So with this, you can actually study a really interesting interlayer exchange interaction. For example, uh, you prepare pancakes with the middle of pancake to be in the rotational ground and the two outer layers to be the rotationally excited. If these are, you don't have, if you don't have spin exchange, these are identical fermions, as I described earlier, there's a P wave interaction can be protected by the barrier. But because the, the spin exchange, you know, you can say the minority, the, the two molecules here can exchange their spin, the rotational excited molecule jumps up, uh, jumps down, the rotationally ground molecule jumps up, the molecule never moves, it's their excitation of the rotational degrees of freedom is, is, is migrating. And then there, these are minority molecules, their S-wave collisions will allow them to be lost. So you can actually study the loss process in this, process, uh, in this case where you have a S-wave two-body loss coefficient and, and you have a P-wave loss coefficient if you do not have a spin exchange. And if your spin exchange, you're tuned to be right around um, then between the P-wave and S-wave, you can just look at the loss and tell you that how, how, how big the spin, spin exchange rate is. And here is uh, uh, data that we can show that, you know, if you prepare the, uh, a sandwich with the, the ground state in the middle and the two excited state in the, in the out, outside, you can see the loss rate decays rather fast, while if you make a sandwich that's all identical, three bonds, uh, no meat in the middle, it's long-lived. Um, if you actually make a sandwich with an, uh, another rotational state which has an even parity with the ground state, then actually, again, looks just like as if there's no interaction because there's no spin exchange when, with opposite, with the even parity rotational states, there's no transition dipole moment. So this technique allows us to select a single pancakes, study spin exchange between individual pancakes, and in the end, we are ready to go on to do the, the itinerant spin models. Here, uh, the, the interesting aspect is we turn on the dipolar interactions by either DC field or microwave field, creating coherence, or both. And then you go back to study, oh, sorry. You back to, go back to study the spin half Hamiltonian, where you have both the Ising interactions and a spin exchange interaction. Those SZs are operators of the entire spin. You have N particles with spin half, so the S equals to N over two. And again, remember the spin is nothing but an opposite parity of rotational state here that you can dress with a microwave. We can control the system with both field strength or angle as well as individual spin state. If you take an average, take a mean field approach, then of course you can actually, that, that Hamiltonian gets, re, gets, gets reduced to be nothing but this difference between this, the Ising interaction, the spin exchange interaction, if we can call this term chi, this is the chi SZ squared, and you have already heard from Monica and many others about so-called single axis twisting. And this is telling you that with dipolar systems like this, you will have a frequency shift. The Hamiltonian is dependent on the spin angle, uh, on this polarization angle. If you, if you drive your spin in the equatorial plane, the dipolar shift is zero. If it's above the equatorial or below the equatorial, you'll have a negative opposite sign of the frequency shift. And all of that can be seen by Ramsey spectroscopy. Uh, these are the, uh, essentially Ramsey, just two pulse Ramsey spectroscopy. This is the putting the equatorial plane where we define zero shift. And what's really beautiful is that you can, you, you can put your spin above the equatorial plane or below the equatorial plane. And you can see that the fringe of Ramsey just moves back and forth. And that's the phase shift. If you plot the phase shift as a function of the density, and you can obviously see the more dense molecules, the SC term becomes bigger, so the slope gets larger, and it's proportional. The slope itself, which is delta phi of, uh, you know, of a certain Ramsey time, it's a frequency shift, tells you the strength of the interaction, uh, Ising and, and uh, exchange interaction of the Hamiltonian parameter. So you can see that this is a very simple technique will allow you to measure this entire interaction parameter space. For example, we can tune the electrical field strength and keeping it perpendicular to the pancake, and you can actually see this chi uh, moves around. It's because, it's, remember, it's a difference between Ising versus exchange. 
And I showed you earlier in slide number four where the Ising and Exchange interactions are, are changing signs. And so you can see the, the difference of which also changes sign here. Uh, you can also change the angle of the electrical field with respect to the pancake. And this is another place where chi can be, can be made just by changing the angle of the electrical field and it can, can also switch sign. Another really interesting area that when, you know, it's not that difficult, it's not that easy. These electrical fields are controlled at parts per million. It's not easy to move this very dynamically over a time scale of a few milliseconds or so. But what we can do very quickly is the internal state. Remember I have n equals to one, mn equals to zero projection, or mn equals to minus one projection. You can think of as, a, as two different spin states or sharing microwave transitions with the ground state. If I drive this, the first spin state, one zero, the interaction is positive. If I go to the one minus one, the interaction is negative by a factor of two. You know, you can think of the two dipoles are either interacting like this when they're driving pi transition, or they're doing this, and it's half. So, it, but, so the, this allows us to dynamically control. Um, you can prepare your coherent superposition between zero, zero, and one minus one. And in the middle of your Ramsey sequence, you do this swap gate. You know, it's, it's not really quantum information, it's not a gate. But it's nevertheless, it's a coherent population swapping between zero and zero, you know, you have a coherent superposition between zero, zero, one, minus one. At the end of this, because you're putting population, this half of the population, uh, this is the coherence, you put this population in another rotational state, you move this population down. If you do this all in a phase coherent fashion by microwave, then you have now transferred the coherent superposition from one minus one to one zero. And what you expect to see is your Ramsey fringe, the face will switch its sign or, or, uh, and it re reverse its, uh, you know, the, this face was accumulating down and when you switch the, to another state because the chi is different by a factor of two and it's positive, the face gets now delayed. And this, all, the, all this again can be read out by just my uh, Ramsey spectroscopy. Doing this can't help but remind you what Monica told us a couple of years ago, remember she wrote this paper about Hamiltonian reversing, and this is the basic idea that you can do this quantum magnification, you know, doing a spin squeezing instead of really hard trying to measure the spin noise along this stretched state, which is difficult, you know, measure the quantum projection noise well below the quantum projection noise. Maybe the reverse the Hamiltonian will allow you to amplify the, the signal up so that you do not have to measure really, really small noise. And for molecules, of course, this is actually a more challenging uh, measurement than atoms for detecting molecular spin superposition with a quantum projection noise limit. So that's nice. This is something we will be thinking about doing when we do molecular spin squeezing. Finally, I want to have a, one more slide. I told you all about the phase advance in Ramsey. Well, there's another quantity, which is the contrast of Ramsey. And we, typically, we do this XY8. This is something we learned from a dynamic decoupling pulse sequence from NMR where you can do this kind of a spin, multi-pulse spin echo. Uh, and you, put, you create a superposition, and you, then you rotate it around x, y pi, 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 pi pulse eight times. And you can repeat this process many, many unlimited amount of time, as long as your coherence is long enough, and your pi pulses are short. You can do many of those. That allow you to remove the single particle dephasing quite effectively. That's because our electrical field has noise and so on. So you can use dynamic decoupling to actually measure the electrical field noise of its aphoria components. But in, real, in, in the experiment, we benefit from doing this kind of dynamic de decoupling, allow us to remove a single particle dephasing so that you can actually really have a dramatic impact. This is without dynamic decoupling, this is with dynamic decoupling. And once you do good enough dynamic decoupling to remove single particle physics, what's left is actually the many body, many body dephasing effect. And what we see is once you have a sufficient number of m times sequence of x, y, eight pulses, there is a still a decay of the contrast, and this decay increases faster than uh, with, the, with the density of the molecules you have in the per pancake. And this process is because, uh, uh, you know, what I was saying earlier, this is this irreversible spin emotional coupling, both spin exchange and emotional. Uh, collisional physics are mediated by the dipole. 
but the collision of physics picks up phase shift for the dipole, which is reducing the contrast. And when the phase shift, get, when the contrast is, gets lower, the dipole moment gets smaller, it's reducing the collision of physics. So it's an interleaved sort of uh, in coupled system. And we are now starting to see the signature of these many body physics and decay by looking at the decay contrast. And in fact, indeed, this decay contrast, we can actually tune the chi, that's this term, the, the Ising minus um, spin exchange interaction, and we find this, this uh, contrast decay slope as a function of the 2D density, the slope scales with chi squared, dipole moment raised to the power of fourth, just, which is what's governing the interactions when the molecules are moving around with dipole moment. I think I'm at the end. As you can see, it's going to be a rich physics. You can study this in the spin domain. You can, we, were, we were going to think about doing the spin squeezing experiments, but of course, we were initially thinking about these as completely separate experiments. These are spin degrees of freedom. These are motional degrees of freedom where you can study hydrodynamics mediated by dipole interactions. But in the end, maybe one should look at them all together, you know, very coupled spin systems in 2D. But of course, if I haven't even mentioned that you can go back to the spin lattice model or you can control the tunneling, the TJ model, uh, there's just a bunch of really rich physics one can study with dipolar molecules. With that, I want to thank the group. This photo is completely outdated and I apologize, but it's just so good that it, it's uh, taking me a really painful time to take this off. But it, the, most of the people actually have left. Giacomo, this tall guy, is actually in this conference right now. Instead, we have a, a set of a new people have joined our group. Cal is now a major force on this experiment. He's actually here is presenting a poster on Thursday, I believe. And Annie is a young graduate student, and Jake Higgins just joined us as a postdoc. Jun Lu from MIT from Wolfgang's group is still working, and we have enjoyed many theory collaborations um, with colleagues both at home and, and far. Thank you very much. Some time for discussion. Questions? No, go ahead. So you told us about a number of uh, of ways of of handling two body uh, losses, uh, uh, how you can protect against them, and and the ways that in which they can be enhanced. What I'm wondering is, could you tell us about what the actual detailed mechanism is? That is how how do these molecules die when they uh, <laughs> undergo a, a, a two-body loss along a channel that allows them to be attracted to each other? Yeah, that, you, you, uh, you, you ask, you're asking a question which is, uh, which is still open. And uh -huh. in fact, uh, you know, Kang Kun Yi, a young professor, well, no longer young, she's like a well-established professor in Harvard. Mm -hmm. She's still pretty young. <laughs> she's still pretty young, but in, intellectually she's a giant now. And, and she has done work specifically to, to answer your question, what's the complex of the dynamics when the two KRB molecules come together? You form KRB2, and then, then they break apart K2RB2, what uh -huh. are the distributions of the which? And, and Wolfgang, I, I don't know if I'm stealing you know, what he's going to say. Uh, you know, Wolfgang has seen, that, you know, you, people can start to see fresh Bucker resonances. But like, what we have been doing you know, for 10 years, we always say, well, this is a unitary loss, meaning Paul Julian predicted there's a black, black hole in the middle, and the, the, when the two molecule gets close enough, the quantum flux just gets sucked in and it's lost. Yeah. You know, so you can calculate the unitary limit of the molecular loss. Well, Wolfgang has now found a surprise where the loss rate he found is bigger than the unitary rate meaning there's some coherence going on in uh -huh. that complex. So, and there's even adding to the more mystery is, remember KRB, when we did the KRB in 14 years ago, when Debbie was around, and we're talking about it, dipole moment was kind of a small, um, 0.5 Debye, although we are seeing a lot of dipolar physics. And, yeah. uh, and uh, another thing that the, the community felt was, oh, KRB is so lossy why don't we go find molecules that was not supposed to have loss? So you find molecules which are not exosomic in the loss process, endothomic. But what a surprise, you know, people, everybody found out that the, the bioalkali molecules come together, you have a unitary loss. 
in and spite that, of the fact that they're uh, yeah they, they're not supposed to be exothermic. Exactly, and so so John people like John Bone and so on have been talking about sticky um, collisions where well the two molecules come together they're going to stay with each other for a while dance around with each other until the third guy is coming in to hit it. And the, the thing is, and or maybe the light itself can destroy the complex. So there's a lot of research going on, but it's not, we haven't found a universal physics, uh, to be honest. The KIB plus KIB, we have never seen the loss by the light. Just yeah. by some other group have seen, different molecules have seen the light actually leads to the complex loss. So it's an open question, Bill. You know, if we, are, if we want to come back to the lab, we <laughs> <laughs> can solve that problem together. And, okay. uh, but they are, it's really interesting. I think we will learn from Wolfgang. Like, it, it, in, in some sense, there's a lot of a surprise coming out of it, just looking at the complex. N never mind dipolar physics I'm talking about now. Yeah. Great. We have other questions. Yes, Monica, go ahead. Um, so beautiful results on the twisting dynamics. I was wondering, Monica. we heard in James Thompson's talk about this concept of gap protection that the spin exchange interactions can help with protecting coherence. So I'm yes. curious whether you've tuned Jay-Z over J-Perp and seen that playing a role in your yeah. system. Yeah, no, excellent question. And this is exactly, we were very interested in looking into that physics. And it turns out, Monica, you know, the spin emotional coupling makes things really complicated. So what we were expecting to see, in fact, if the spin model had been perfect, if the, if the molecules were not moving around, then what you will see is that the, the decay of the contrast, you can reverse it, and the contrast will actually go back up, right? So that would be like really interesting. You can not only see the, the Ramsey phase reverse it, but its contrast should always also go up because you're reversing the dephasing mechanism. But what do we, so, so we actually searched for that for a little while, and I think the, the thing is, what's interesting is the dipole moment, by the time we tune up to be 0.3 Dubai with this, this transition dipole moment, the collisional physics, the D to the four collisional physics, gives you a time scale of 10 milliseconds. So you have to do all these reversals below 10 milliseconds. Then you can see that those kind of a, and you can see gap protection, as you were saying. But it, once you go beyond a few milliseconds, five to 10 milliseconds, then the, the spin and emotional equilibrium becomes so entangled, you cannot reverse back. And this has actually been something we really studied very hard in the last two or three months because it would be great to see both regimes. A great question. And we have time for maybe just one more question. Any other questions? Yes. Got it. The, um, so Wolfgang's question was, what's limiting T over TF? The initial limiting of T over TF was just how de deeply degenerate you can make your atomic uh, system. And so 0.3, and in principle from 0.3 you can do evaporation. Uh, we just haven't gone back to you know, the T over TF 0.3, we do evaporation. I think it will still be tremendously useful. You can create more molecules so that you can allow yourself to evaporate, to lose some molecules. The efficiency is good, but it's not terribly good, you know, you know, phase space density in 2D evaporation, if you want to be phase space density to be constant, then the log n, d log n, d log t would be slope of two. We got a slope of one, so it's pretty efficient, but we still lose molecules, and if you have only a couple thousand per pancake, by the time you go to T over TF of uh, 0.1 or below, you may have just a couple hundred molecules. And uh, I've been talking to some students, you know, maybe, in the future, Professor Zoe Yen and uh, Professor Giacomo and, and so <laughs> are going to use cavities with molecules, just like you proposed, and that would be a perfect system, you know, with a cavity detuned, um, getting into this non-perturbative, non-destroyed um, non version of detecting molecules would be, would be the way to go. Okay. Great, let's thank June again.